Well, hey y'all and welcome back to the channel or if it's your first time here, welcome especially. I'm Sally and I am so excited that you've stopped by. Today's video is all about period pain, specifically why this does not have to be your reality. And this is something it has taken me personally quite a while to believe just because it has not been my experience and it is very far from the norm in terms of what most people experience. That being said, just because it has been normalized, just because it is common, does not mean it is truly normal in terms of how your body is supposed to function. Period pain is indicative of something being wrong at the foundational level. So what we're gonna do today is talk about the two different common types of period pain that people are experiencing. And as a part of that, some ways that we can work to improve these symptoms. Um, symptoms really are just your body talking to you and we can learn a lot from them to correct issues underneath that can affect us in far too many ways down the road if they remain uncorrected and anyways that's tangential i'm having a day but okay um the two types of period pain are going to be number one spasmodic period pain and number two congestive period pain i want to make it very clear that it's common for people to experience some of both of these, but you will likely relate more to one set of symptoms than another set of symptoms, which can give you good indication as to where to start. So starting with that spasmodic period pain, um, it's kind of, as it sounds, spasms of pain. Um, you might have like an underlying dull ache, um, but you're often experiencing these twinges. It kind of comes and it goes. It's rather intense and then it's okay. It's also likely at least in a lot of people, it's going to be accompanied by digestive upset. If you are familiar with a good old period poop, I know that is just so glamorous. Um, but if you know, you know, digestive upset. Um, it also is not really going to start until no more than about two days, most likely before your period itself. Um, it might not even include intense PMS symptoms, but it's going to be that relatively intense pain, especially lower abdomen, lower back, thighs during your period itself. So the other type is going to be congestive period pain. And this is related to progesterone, whereas that spasmodic type is going to be related to inflammation um, and how your body is regulating your inflammatory response. Congestive period pain suggests that you do not have enough progesterone or that you are going through estrogen dominance. So your ratio of estrogen to progesterone is off and functionally, you do not have enough progesterone for that reason. Um, I want to make one more distinction. So going back to spasmodic, in order to be experiencing this, we always have to be ovulating. For you to be having congestive period pain, you might not actually be ovulating every month because again, it's indicative of not having enough progesterone. Um, and if you have no clue whether or not you're ovulating, highly recommend you doing basal body temperature tracking. I've talked before about a device called TempDrop. You just slide it on your arm. You're going to wear that at night. It's gonna take your temperature. Um, and if you track your temperature over the course of the month, you can identify a rise in temperature, assuming ovulation occurred. I have other videos on this specifically. I will do my best to link one below so you can check that out. But if we see that rise in temperature and it stays high, um, that generally helps us to know that ovulation has occurred. And if our temperatures are not staying high throughout the end of our cycle, then that's often indicative that our progesterone levels are also not staying high enough. So little fun fact there, that can hopefully be helpful for you. Um, so symptoms of this congestive period pain. Oftentimes it is actually gonna start at the beginning of your luteal phase. So as much as two weeks before your period, it might not even be um, intense cramping at the time of your period, but like crazy PMS symptoms. If you're someone who gets really mad mood swings, um, if you're someone who has crazy cravings, anything like that, um, that is likely indicative of more of that congested period pain. Again, recognizing that oftentimes it's gonna be a little bit of both going on, not super black and white. So there are, there's definitely overlap between the two types in terms of the foundations and what we wanna focus on, but there are a few key areas that I wanna highlight um, for each respectively of where we can uh, really work to hopefully see improvement. So going back to spasmodic, two areas I want to talk about are going to be digestion and fatty acid balance. So digestion is really key to our inflammatory response. If 
your digestion is upset, if you're not absorbing nutrients properly, if it is wrecking your body to try and absorb nutrients, you're going to see inflammation. So I have a whole video on optimizing digestion, which I highly recommend you check out. Of course, that will also be linked below. Um, but some key takeaways, number one, we wanna remember that digestion is gonna start in the head, not just in the mouth or in the stomach. We want to be in a parasympathetic state before we eat in that rest and digest state. So um, preparing your meal actively, being around the sights and smells um, helps to stimulate saliva production. And also we wanna make sure we're maybe doing some deep breathing, we're setting aside distractions when we're eating so we can truly be in that rested state before we start chewing up our food even because your body is not really designed to digest and do other stuff at the same time, at least initially in the process. If we're stressed out, your body is for lack of better words, in your fight or flight state. You have your fight or flight state and you have your rest and digest state. Um, and when you're in that fight or flight state, digestion really shuts down. You also wanna make sure you're chewing your food properly. You want proper mechanical breakdown. That's gonna be really key to proper chemical breakdown. We wanna make sure we have enough hydrochloric acid. Um, check out the digestion video for more on that. We can also, if you have a lot of food sensitivities, especially, or you find that just your stomach gets upset really easily different things can be causing that but we can always incorporate some um, foods that are really supportive to the gut lining to a healthy mucosal lining so things like gelatin and bone broth those are going to be high in glycine which is really supportive for your digestive system second main point when it comes to that spasmodic period pain is going to be your fatty acid balance so prostaglandins are these magical not magical little things um kind of like hormones that are what regulate our inflammatory response you have prostaglandins that inflame and prostaglandins that anti-inflame that calm that down it is crucial that we have both of these because inflammation is actually really important we just don't want to stay inflamed so if we um are missing any of those if they're out of balance whether it's the inflammatory or the anti-inflammatory we can see chaos in our bodies and overall levels of inflammation might be higher. So again, we talked about how um, spasmodic period pain is related to inflammation. Well, those prostaglandins are what are regulating that inflammatory response. Each prostaglandin is tied to a fatty acid, to an essential fatty acid. So if we are eating um, not enough fat or if we are eating the wrong kinds of fat, we are likely going to see excess inflammation in the body potentially resulting, manifesting in this type of period pain. So a few key takeaways given the world we generally live in and what we tend to eat. Number one, we want to avoid polyunsaturated fatty acids, specifically in their processed forms. As a whole, we only want about 10% of our fat intake to be coming from those polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and it's important to get that because your omega-3s and your omega-6s come through here. However, unfortunately, I don't have an exact percentage, but we are eating way more polyunsaturated fats most of the time than we're eating other fatty acids because we have kind of been fed this lie um, that you know saturated fat is evil polyunsaturated fats are the healthy option whereas realistically they are incredibly unstable they dump free radicals into your body especially when they're not being eaten in their natural forms when they are processed or when they're eating eaten in excess um, and they cause a ton of inflammation so we want to avoid things like canola oil just vegetable oils in general um, Especially anytime something's fried or cooked at a high temperature, we want to be cooking in a saturated fat. Um, and we want to eat things like nuts and seeds in moderation. Nuts and seeds, I'm never going to be one to be like, oh, rule those out because it's a whole food. It can be really supportive. It also has vitamin E in it as well as like fish. Um, fatty fish has a lot of vitamin E in it, which balances out the PUFAs. Um, however, if you're eating copious amounts of like nut butter, for instance, or like replacing all of your dairy products with milk alternatives, you are likely getting way more of those polyunsaturated fats that are going to be ideal. So also getting in a little bit deeper to this, we have our omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids. Both of these are really important. Both of them are directly tied to one of our prostaglandins, respectively. However, oftentimes we are getting way more omega-6 than we are getting omega-3, especially from these conventional sources of polyunsaturated fatty acids. The ideal ratio is about two um, omega-6s to one omega-3. And again, don't have the exact ratio on this, but the reality is that most of us are consuming at least like 10 times the amount of omega-6 as we are the amount of omega-3. Um, so just be mindful. I recommend like looking up different foods, like 
nuts can be a good way and seeds can be a good way to get omega-3 in moderation. Flax is really great. I want to say chia is really great. Um, but look up omega-6 to omega-3 ratio and you want to look for something that has more omega-3. Um, not necessarily more omega-3 than omega-6, but like a more favorable ratio. I really love salmon. I love mackerel. These are foods that we try to include weekly. I know there's some differences of opinion on that, but um, I find it really supportive in my diet. And again, because the PUFAs in it are coming with that vitamin E, it's kind of neutralizing the effect, so to say, as long as it's not being eaten in excess. So this is a more minute point here because I always want to start with whole foods and not major on the minors of supplementation. However, if you do have um, a meal that is particularly dense in PUFAs, you might supplement with some vitamin E oil um, or a vitamin E capsule. You just want to make sure that it's in MCT oil, um, that it's not in sunflower oil or something like that because recall that is a PUFA and then all of the antioxidant properties of the vitamin E are going to be going towards neutralizing the free radicals, um, the volatility essentially of the PUFA. So it negates itself and is serving you no purpose and is a waste of money. Um, moving on to that congestive type of period, period pain and progesterone. So if our progesterone is a low number one, you should go check out my video on estrogen dominance because generally what's happening, our estrogen levels are too high. It drops our estrogen, excuse me, it drops our progesterone levels down way too low. Um, Stress is a major factor here and there's carryover if we're super stressed out We're gonna see a lot more inflammation generally speaking But in terms of progesterone if we're stressed and our cortisol levels are high It's gonna drive estrogen levels up. It's going to drive your progesterone levels down There are so many things that could be stressing our bodies. We could be fasting. We could have experienced a serious emotional event We could be um, Overworking or maybe it's through our diet, but the bottom line is even if your diet is on point if you are experiencing a lot of stress somewhere else in your life, you are likely not going to see the improvement that you are looking for because your body is essentially being told it is not safe to focus on reproduction and therefore you are not going to have a safe or rather a healthy cycle. Um, so we talked about stress. Another thing that kind of ties into stress, but also estrogen as a whole is going to be body fat percentage. Now I'm not going to sit here and give you like an ideal body fat percentage that you could be because there are plenty of different bodies at different body fat percentages that are healthy for them. However, if you do not have enough body fat or if you do not have, or if you have too much body fat, you are likely going to see an issue here. Um, if we do not have enough body fat, we're going to be really stressed out. That's just a major stressor on the body. Cortisol levels are going to stay higher. It's going to affect estrogen levels. That's going to drive progesterone down. Again, just think about if your body is focused on survival, on I need nutrients, and that's all it can it can really think about. It's not going to be um, really in a place where it wants to bring a baby into the world, even if it's not your goal to bring a baby into the world. Remember that your fertility is a marker of overall health, and it's something we want to strive for regardless. If you have too much body fat, um, your adipose tissue produces estrogen, um, and so that's a, a common area where we might see estrogen dominance or just too much estrogen estrogen in the body progesterone being driven down this is something that i personally experienced um if you've been here for a little bit you know that my husband and i did a pro metabolic shred um tuck and cheek which you can go check out in losing i don't remember i don't remember how much body fat i lost in terms of percentage but in dropping my body fat percentage down from i want to say it was like around 25 percent initially and i think it's closer to like 22% now. I don't know exactly. Um, that was like the biggest change that I saw um, affecting my period pain. So it's just an honest area to check in. We want to make sure also that if we do need to approach fat loss, that we are doing so from a healthy, well-balanced perspective, that we are prioritizing metabolic health first, um, and that it's not just becoming a a greater stressor on the body because that can ultimately just make things worse. So digestion is also really going to impact um, estrogen levels and progesterone levels. One thing I want to highlight is going to be fiber intake. We want to make sure we're eating enough um, insoluble fiber because that's going to help detox excess estrogen from the body. You've probably heard people talk about a raw carrot salad. There's nothing magic about the raw carrot salad, but it can be really helpful um, to eat to help get rid of that excess estrogen. And I have heard of people who have implemented it every single day um, and within a couple months have pretty much 
had a pain-free period so definitely something worth checking out something that i actually learned recently is that ideally we do not want to have that raw carrot salad with other food um, because it can affect nutrient absorption of the other food so just be discerning in terms of what you're eating it with or if you're eating it with anything else um, and then kind of getting into the nitty-gritty more like supplementation which is never where i would start but which can be helpful vitamin e once again can actually really help with your progesterone production um, and number two um, we can supplement with progesterone itself. This is something you want to be careful with. I know that Noelle Covery has a topical progesterone, which at least seems to me like that might be a little bit less risky than like an one that you're going to take internally. Something to research extensively and talk with a practitioner about um, because you can be affected by too much progesterone it's just something that you want to um, again weigh very carefully and and handle appropriately. So Anyways, those are things that you can check out if this is really a struggle for you. Um, obviously, I'm not getting into everything here. Uh, I'm thinking that I'm going to do either my next cycle or one soon, a video talking about supporting a healthy period. Um, but if there's anything in particular you want to see, please comment down, comment that comment that down below oh my goodness i know that a lot of people do use castor oil packs um, i have not gotten into that a ton myself so i don't feel quite ready to talk about that here but if you have experience with castor oil packs and want to share in the comments that would be amazing i'm knocking stuff over but i'm gonna head out until next time thanks for being here bye y'all